Hello everyone! In this um, short tutorial I want to show you the end system in Maya, the nucleus system, um, which is used for simulating uh, particles, end cloth and in hair. And um, yeah, this is really useful for um, not only dynamic simulations, but also for example if you want a tablecloth on your table or a pillow on the bed and you want realistic folds and creases. In this tutorial we're going to build this little demo scene with a party table, some uh, banners on the line, and some confetti. If we take a look at the node editor, which is over here under Windows, um, we can see that in the, cent in the center of everything there is the nucleus, and it's connected to all the um, N objects, the N cloth, the hair system, and the N particles. And um, as you can see, it's it's uh, connected to all of them, and um, that is because the nucleus is the so-called solver. This node uh, contains code which um, yeah calculates the position of each of these vertices, vertices for example, on each frame. So it says that it, it gives it a velocity, a force, and um, calculates what it looks like, or where it would be on the next frame. And it does that for every vertex, every control vertex, and every particle. And um, the good thing about using one solver and not se separate solvers for the particles, for the cloth, and for the line is that they can interact. So, um, for example, these um, cloth objects here, they drag this line down and uh, give it uh, give their weight. Um, and the other way around, um, this line can influence the um, banners so to, uh, to not fall down. And um, if we would crank up the mass of the particles, they would also um, visibly interact with the cloth. Um, in this case, they are really light because they're confetti, so they are not going to move the end cloth. Yes, this is just uh, for, an, for an illustration what this end system is and uh, how it works. And um, you don't, however, like it's it's not really important when you work with it. Just know that that this is it, it is there, and um, this is the basic of the basis of everything. Um, so in this nucleus solver, we have all the natural properties like gravity or wind, stuff like that. We can also change the substeps here, so the amount of uh, recalculations that are done each frame. So basically, it's not just saying what is the position of that particle on frame twenty five and on twenty six. But it's also saying what is on 25.3, 25.6, 25 25.9. And um, that's defined by the substeps. If you set this to really high value, it's going to calculate many, many, many substeps per frame. And it's going to take especially long. So keep them as low as possible. But if you have glitches or weird stuff happening, especially with fast moving objects, um, you will need to adjust these substeps. Um, also, a very important thing to keep in mind when you're simulating is that the playback speed is not set to real time because that will skip frames in the calculation, and it will look correct, but it will it will be um, yeah, it will be having issues, and, and in this case you can even see it's having uh, visually um, an influence here. So this is not correctly done, correctly simulated, and that is because um, right here you can see this is this stretching is not normal. And this is because um, when you have the real-time uh, playback enabled, Maya is going to try to um, keep this in running in real-time and it's going to skip some frames. And skipping frames is not working with, an, with a simulation. As you can see, if I scrub around, it tries to, to adapt the simulation, but it's not really working. And so always keep in mind to set the playback speed to play every frame, either free or maximum real-time. If you have a really light simulation where, where nothing much is happening, maybe just one particle fa falling down or a really simple angle of an object, um, that this is going to go through really, really fast and it's going to be uh, annoying to work with. So I usually set it to play every frame maximum real time. So it plays every single frame as fast as it, as it can, but uh, limited to the real time. So it can't go faster than real time. And that's the op for me, this is the optimal setting to work with. As if I have really large scale simulations and I want to speed up the um, Time I need to wait for the for objects to move. Like if I have some huge huge spaceship parts flying around and in a really large scene, I might set it to um, free, 
to um, just see the overall movement over the whole scene, over the whole uh, shot that I'm working on. But um, especially for small scale simulations or when I have like really quick simulations, um, I usually set it to um, every frame maximum real time. Okay, so um, let's start building the scene and um, I'm gonna just delete all the um, simulation objects um, so we don't have to model everything again. If you want to have this scene, I can see if I can upload it on uh, my Google Drive and if it will stay there, I'm not sure, but it should. Um, and I'm gonna do that and uh, the link will be in the description of the video so you can download this scene as it is right now. I've cleaned up the scene a little bit more and renamed some objects and um, this is how it looks now. And I'm gonna create an end cloth from this. Why this menu? You have to be in the FX menu set. So normally you start with the modeling tool set or the modeling menu set. Then you have to switch to FX and there you have all the end system uh, stuff. And under end cloth there's create end cloth. And um, with the object selected you can create this end cloth. And you can see it creates an end cloth and a nucleus because there's no other nucleus in this scene. If I just for test don't do this, create from this an end cloth, you're gonna see it's just creating an end cloth and connecting it internally. You can't see it but it's internally visible in the node editor, it's connecting it to this nucleus. So you have two objects which can interact. You can, however, if you want to create a new Encloth object and create a new solver, that's also possible. But generally it's, uh, yeah, if you want them to interact, just use the same solver. And uh, the thing you need to keep in mind with Encloth objects and um, simulations in general is that these use the real geometry that's there to deform the mesh. So if you have just a really low resolution, it's not going to work. So basically the solver takes all of these vertices and deforms it or moves them according to um, the forces and the other objects in the scene. And um, that it's, it's doing this on every frame. And if you have a really low resolution object, let's try it out with this plane for example. Um, let's make it really, really simple, just two by two maybe. Um, then you're going to see that it's not deforming properly. Look at this, it's not deforming properly and that's because it doesn't have enough geometry to deform the mesh. Um, so keep in mind that you have um, enough geometry on your object before turning it into end cloth. Something you also need to keep in mind is the um, uh, cache playback, which is a new feature in Maya 2020, I think, or was a new feature back then. and. Um, it's now involved. It's actually working pretty nicely. You can see if I enable it, I have this blue bar and the red line filling it up. So it's uh, simulating in the background while I'm doing nothing, while I'm idle. And then I can just play it back and it's running smoothly in full uh, speed. And um, this can be really useful, but it can also cause issues. And um, you're going to see this at the end when we have all this stuff enabled. It's going to show a warning and it's going to be yellow or something. And um, I usually uh, would recommend to not use this uh, if you don't have really simple scenes like this because it might c cause problems with deformers and other stuff. It's just overall not very advanced at the moment and um, it's probably going to cause you more issues than it's going to help you. So I'll just leave it turned off. You can try it out but um, keep in mind that if you have issues it might be this little button here which is enabled. It's a nice feature but it's not working. Um, good in every situation and it's causing problems sometimes so yeah keep that in mind. Okay um, if we now play back the scene and remember the playback speed uh, should be set correctly we're gonna see it falls down and um, one thing that we have to keep in mind when doing simulations um, is the scene scale because um, the Maya solver the nucleus uses a meter scene scale while normally um, everything in Maya is centimeters. So usually this is one centimeter, but when you're simulating, the nucleus thinks that this is one meter. So if we load in a human from the content browser, which is always good for references, um, we're gonna see that it's um, really huge, and um, but the simulation is running meter scale. So um, if, you have, if you have the scene built to scale, um, so the table is about this size, then you have to change uh, the size or the scale setting in the nucleus solver. Um, if you go really quite quite a bit down, 
to scale attributes, you can set the space scale then to um, 0 0.01 meters. So it's uh, smaller. So then th this is this is 0 0.01 meter, so uh, one centimeter. But I have modeled this in a smaller scale, so um, we can just leave the solver setting as it is. And we don't need the human because uh, he's not helping us. And um, if we now run the simulation, you can see that this end cloth falls down and through the floor and just, yeah, goes down infinitely. And obviously we wanted to collide with the table and the floor. And we're going to select both of them and make them a passive collider. And although this is under end cloth, the create passive collider, this is working for everything. So if you sometimes you create particles and want a ground plane, then you have to, for the ground plane, don't search here for the passive object. You have to go to end cloth and create passive code. It's just in this menu because this made the, the most sense for the developer, for the developers. This passive collider is not related to anchor specifically, but to the whole nuclear system. So also the particles and the uh, hair system will also collide with this passive collider. And, um, yeah, let's create a passive collider. And um, now this cloth object should feel these objects um, and collide with them. And as we can see, does exactly that. It slides off though, and um, in some cases it also might look weird, and I'm going to show you what that might be. Um, so under the, uh, if you click on the object, you're usually going directly to um, the end cloth, the, en uh, the end rigid shape. Uh, you can also click the, uh, the um, rigid itself. Um, in this case for this table, it's the end rigid shape too. So this one here. And in there we have uh, a thickness, and the thickness is uh, how thick this object is used or is seen as in the co for the collision or for the solver. And we can display this just as a preview, and this is what the solver sees. And may sometimes it might be too big or too small, and then you see either um, in the final simulation something like this, which is looking weird, or if it's way too small, it's, it's gonna clip through. Normally this is this is already working, but sometimes you need to adjust it and so it's useful to know and uh, have this visualization here. Okay, so it's colliding now, but we can see that it's sliding off. And we can do something about that. We can change the properties of either the end cloth or of the widget. Um, so under the end cloth we have collisions and collisions tab and this this is cause uh, this is handling the interaction with other objects. So the collision, and we have bounce friction and sti stickiness. And what we're interested in right now is fri uh, friction. And in this case, we can change it for the end cloth. But what we also could do is change it for the end rigid. That's going to do the same thing. Um, it's all dependent. Like these values are going to be multiplied internally. So um, if this has a high friction and this has a low friction, it's going to interact with the medium friction. But if this has a high friction, and this, for example, also has a high friction, it's going to be extremely friction, uh, extremely, uh, extremely much friction. So it's not going to slide around at all. Um, so yeah, depending on how you want this cloth to act and how you want this rigid to interact, um, you can change it on either one of them. In my case, I'm going to uh, use choose the rigid and ch change the um, friction over here. It's also under collisions, and I'm going to just going to raise it to like 0.6 or something. I'm gonna Take a look, and now it slides way less, but we can still see it slides a little bit. And um, to fix this, I'm also going to raise the stickiness. And stickiness is basically a force that is acting uh, along the normals. And if we have a look at our normals, um, polygons and vertex or phase normals, we can see that um, these are basically the f directions of the force that this is going to cause. So it's going to, when it collides, it's going to take a bit of force and apply it in this direction. So it's going to suck the mesh on. And that way we have a stickiness, it's an effect that the mesh is sticking to, uh, like the cloth is sticking to the table. And that will help us to make it not slide. And you can see this, it's, it's working pretty nicely. We now have this uh, cloth simulation, which uh, itself is really, really nice. And um, if you just want this um, cloth on your table and maybe you just want to render a still image, you can now just take this and delete the history, or you can just duplicate it, and that way you will have 
the exact mesh you have right now and uh, you can use it in your in your um, renders and this is a really useful workflow if you have something like pillows or uh, yeah or tablecloth in your scene and you just want this to deform nicely so you don't have to model this by hand and sculpt it and make create all these little folds and stuff uh, by yourself um, this is a really simple way to create this amount of detail and realistic deformation and um, yeah but in our case we want some more simulations going on just to uh, learn some more about the end system okay so now we can create these banners we have this uh, banner geometry here really simple and crude but it works for now and we have these poles which actually do nothing they are just there for decoration so you can ignore them and um, also we have this curve here this is going to be the wire which the banners hang on we already talked about how um, the encloth needs a lot of resolution and um, this is the same for these uh, hairs for the curves and we're gonna make this curve dynamic but it only has four vertices right now so before we turn this into a hair we're gonna um, curves and rebuild and we're gonna use the option box and I've set it to 100 and that's um, for this scene scale and for this length of the curve the a good amount you have to try it out and uh, try around which is working keep in mind the more uh, spans you have the more vertices you have and the more resolution you have but it's also going to take lo longer to calculate so yeah don't set it to crazy values so like yeah 100 in this case is enough and uh, good if we go to control vertices uh, cvs we can see we have uh, a lot of them now and um yeah these banners also have a good resolution you need to keep this in mind too so they can deform properly and now we want to turn this uh, curve into a hair and um, that, that, that's why we're going to go to the N hair tab and if you use the create hair option you're going to create hair on an object so this is not going to work with the curve we just want this, this one curve dynamic and um, that's when we're going to choose make selected curves dynamic and by default it's going to pin the ends of the curve so if we choose this choose this option like this we are going to see that it's just falling down but the ends are attached to the original position and this is not because of the poles these are irrelevant you don't need them this is just the default behavior of the n uh, hair system or better to say not of the n hair system in general but of this option where you create dynamic curves or where you, where you make a curve dy dynamic uh, it's automatically going to attach the ends now that we have this curve we can see it's really really stretchy and we're going to change that so we select the hair system here and in the attribute editor we can uh, go to the dynamic properties and um, raise the stretch resistance maybe the compression resistance a little bit and um, take a look at it again and we can see it's a bit it's a bit less stretchy but it's still really long and there comes in the uh, rest length scale this is a nice option um, so basically this is the length this curve has when it's uh, rested and um, with this scale we can um, shorten this and give it some pressure some some uh, it's it's already stretched when we start the simulation and we're gonna see this right now it's really it's, it's way shorter and not hanging down so much and we can also make this really 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 tight and um, yeah you can adjust this on the fly um, when you have the banners hanging on it so um, it looks good and doesn't drag down to the floor and this curve is the old curve which is kept in the scene we can hide it for now because we don't need it it is now called uh, nested under a follicle node which is basically telling the end system this is the curve we're going to use and um, yeah now we have this um, output curve and this output curves um, group okay so we now want this these banners to be end cloth objects and we want to attach them to the curve and um, to the hair basically and the first step is of course making turning them into end cloth objects and if we click here we can see it's creating four of them for each object one which is a bit annoying because we have to change every option we change on four objects 
What can help here is um, the attribute spreadsheet. We can uh, change the attributes for multiple objects at the same time. Um, so if we go to all here, you can see there are no end cloth options, and that's because this is the transform node, and underneath there's a shape node, and this is the node that contains the settings. So if all these selected, press the down arrow, and you're gonna go one level deeper to the shape, and um, here you're gonna find all the uh, all the uh, settings, for example, band resistance and all these uh, all these uh, options you find here. And um, what we want to do on here is we want uh, basically we want to don't change anything except for the mass, and this is under dynamic properties. Um, you don't have the mass down here, so these are really heavy right now with a mass of one. Um, for their size and for their material they're made of, they're probably made of paper or something. So I'm gonna set this a, a bit down to like 0.1 and that's gonna work much better and um, later in the simulation not drag down the curve too much. Okay, now we have these end cloth objects and um, if we simulate the scene you can see they're also falling down and on the floor and um, that's it. Basically really, really simple and really boring. But now comes the interesting part and we want to attach these end cloth objects to the curve. And, um, and that's not that's a bit more complicated, but uh, we're going to take a look at how this is done. Um, so we have up here the end constraints menu, and a constraint is basically um, the way to tell an object uh, to interact or to yeah to stick to another object, for example, or to stick to a certain point. So if we select this vertice, for example and um, add a transform constraint. It's gonna add this locator and um, we're gonna see that this is gonna be uh, hanging on this locator now. And another really cool thing is under, under FX we have this interactive playback so we can play around with uh, stuff while um, while we're simulating. So let's if we run this, run this and move this around we can drag this banner through the scene which is kind of cool. Okay, um, but we don't want a transform constraint because this is just keeping it at one space where this locator is positioned and um, yeah, sticking this vertex to, vertice to it and sticking this vertex to it. Um, but we want this these vertic vertices at the top, these right here, sticking to the curve. So we're gonna select the curve, control vertices and these four. Now we're going to right click and go to multi, so both of them are selected. So we have the vertices of this um, end cloth and the vertices of the, uh, the the control vertices of the curve. And then we can go um, to a component to component constraint. And you can see these little green things appearing. And um, these are connecting the mesh vertices up there to the curve. Um, if you have just the curve selected, it's going to create constraints to every single vertex, uh, control vertex of the curve, and um, that's why we need to select um, the speci the uh, control vertices specifically that we want to use. Um, I can show you this. If you select both of them, just the curve, then you're going to create constraints to all of these points, and that's not the thing we're going to do. So yeah, keep that in mind. Um, so now these two meshes are connected, and if we play this back, we're gonna see um, this, which is looking quite nice, but we can see that these are stretching a little bit. And um, in most cases, these um, would be attached a bit differently. So um, if we want to, we can change the constraint with method from spring to weld or to rubber band. This is also another option. But what we are going to use is weld, and that's going to weld basically uh, the points to the curve, 
and attach them strongly and um, then we can see this is connected perfectly to the curve. And now we can see this is hanging on there. We've attached the first banner. A um, bit of a cumbersome part is now we have to repeat this for every one of them. And if you have many banners, this is going to be really annoying. But what we can do is um, select each one of them. And um, with shift, you can select both of them at the same time. And create a component to component. And the same here. Shift select the curve, the control vertices, uh, add to the selection, and constrain component to component. Select this, shift, select this, control shift, select this, and component to component. And if we now play back this, the, the scene, we're going to see that these are attached properly. But as you can see, they're really, really heavy and dragging down the curve quite a bit. So we can make them even lighter. And um, we're going to select the, cur the, the cloths. And we're going to use the attribute spreadsheet again. And um, as you remember, we have to go down to the shape node, which is um, nested underneath this so-called transform node, which is every, every node has this. Basically, you can see every node has the transform and the shape node. And with the arrow down, we're going to go to the shape node. So it's going to select all of these underneath there. And there are the options, and we can find them here. And if we now search for mass, we're going to find the point mass. And we can put this to point 0.1 on all of them. Let's see. This is looking way better and um, really nicely. And we've got our banner. Oh, our banner is on the line. Really cool. Um, for the last step, I'm going to show you the um, n-particle system. So I've had, I have this plane up here. You can cut out anyway. It's not going to matter, really. Um, and we're going to create um, an n-particles system with this. And um, if you use any of the options up here, you're going to have a different deck. And you're going to have different uh, possibilities to create particles here. But what we are going to use is emit from object, and this is actually the one I use myself the most, probably. Um, yeah, let's emit from object. Also, watch out in most of these menus, for example, in particles, you have legacy particles also. These are not in system particles, these are old particles, which were there before the system got, got made by Autodesk. So, um, these systems are not going to be interacting with the end cloth or the end hair. And, um, they're also working, but um, not in the way you would want them to work uh, or want them to use. And they're here for legacy reasons, so you don't need to use them at all. Just remember that you don't accidentally use one of these because they are called the same and have the same icons. And yeah, it's a bit annoying. But yeah, up here, this is the right one, emit from object. You can click here and you can create n particles that will be emitted from this object. And we're going to see it creates quite a lot of them. And it's going to lag, be laggy really quickly because this is a lot of particles. Under the emitter, there is um, uh, the emitter shape. I call this emitter. I could call it whatever. right? And it's going to have a shape node. And it's going to have an emitter node. Let's call it like uh, plane. So. And emitter. And in the emitter, we have some settings. And... Um, what we're going to change here is the emitter type from Omni to Surface. So we want to emit from the entire surface, from every point, not just from the vertices. And now it's going to look like this. It's going to be less because uh, the surface is just one object, while uh, this is multiple uh, little points from which the up emit emissions are going to start. Um, and if this is still too much or too less, um, we can change the rate here, which is particles per second. Um, so in one second we want to emit 100 particles right now and I think that is fine. We can lower it a bit to like 50 so it runs a bit smoother and a bit faster um, just for performance reasons but you can change this as you want. It's really useful to work with a low number at the start and then um, crank it up a little bit at the end when you do your final simulation 
But yeah, for now this is looking really good. One thing we can see is that these particles are, are hovering here. And this might look really, really weird. So we're going to go over to the particle shape node and um, take a look at the particle size. This is basically, these points are just points in the, in the viewport. They are not uh, representing the size of the particles. Um, I think if we want the colli the collision size to be visible, we can set it here to collision thickness. And now we can see how big these particles really is. And at the moment they collide with the environment, but not with themselves, so they can stick in each other. Um, if we enable safe self-collide, you're going to see that uh, they also collide with themselves and um, roll over each other. Um, we don't need this right now, but what we need to do is we need to lower the size of the particles because they are way too big. So this radius here, let's put it to point 0 0.1 and point 0 0.01 and um, now we're going to have to recalculate the simulation and you're going to see it's they are landing on the table and not having this weird collision and or this too large collision. We can put the solar display to off so we can just see the particles in the report. And if you want a different representation here, um, you can go down, down to um, shading. And there you have the particle render type set to points. This is points, it's not going to change size. right? You get, they're always having the same size uh, on the display. Like They are the same amount of pixels. So if you zoom really far out, they're going to seem a bit bigger. And if you go really close, it's not going to change size. You can also, but keep in mind this is only in the viewport, right? This is just a representation. Um, we can change this to uh, spheres, and now we have little spheres, and we can, um, if we now change the um, radius, you can also see this in the viewport with the points. This is not visible in the viewport because they're just points after all. And um, what I'm gonna use right now, because we have confetti, and I don't want to create an, an instancer, which is pretty advanced, so um, we just want a preview in the, in the viewport. I'm going to create sprites and these sprites are really big in the beginning and um, if you're rendering this you're pr probably not going to use the sprites but you're going to rather use geometry that you instance on every point. Um, I'm going to make a video about this at some point but um, this is too advanced for now and I'm not going to show you that right now. We're just going to use sprites and look at it in the viewport and that's enough for now. And these sprites are really huge at the moment so we're going to change um, the size and um, down here we have sprite attributes and I'm gonna change this to 0 point, uh, 0 0.01 by 0 0.01 and now they're really small maybe I'm gonna want this to be um, these kinds of confetti um, particles it's not looking really pretty and they're not gonna bend like the real particles or the real confetti would um, in that case you might want to use Encloth again or just um, use some uh, instances but for now, this is enough, and uh, it's uh, it's uh, getting the point across. If we now play back the scene, we can see the confetti is falling down and onto the other objects. And if we raise, for example, um, the mass of the particles, it's under, not under collisions, but under dynamic properties, the mass. If we put this to like really, really large number, we will, we will see that these particles interact with the other cloth objects. And you can see this here. They're gonna indent and deform the object, the end cloth object, the tablecloth a little bit. And, and that is what makes the nuclear system um, so nice. Um, because normally you would have to, um, it would be really, really um, bothersome to um, tell the end cloth to react to the particles and the other way around. And that way it's really simple because it's just using one solver and um, uh, calculating every object interacting with each other. And um, we obviously don't want really ha and we obviously don't want really heavy confettis so let's set them to 0 0.05 for example and they're gonna be much lighter and they're gonna be falling down. And if you want to change some settings they're all in the end particle node offers things for things like for example gravity um, which is by the way gonna influence every object in the scene you can find these in the nucleus uh, uh, you know, uh, nucleus node 
And if you want to change the way these are emitted, you can go to the emitter. So you have for particles, you have three different um, stations where you can change settings and um, influence the simulation. It's the emitter, the end particles, the end particle node, and the nucleus. And for the end cloth, it's just the nucleus and um, the end cloth itself. Or in this case, it's this one, I think. Um, and obviously for the hair, you have the hair system and the nucleus. Um, and Keep in mind, nucleus is going to influence all objects in this scene. So if we raise this gravity to something crazy like 90, you're going to see that all the objects react differently. But let's keep it at 9.8, like it should be. And yeah, for example, we can we can change the air density. This is really cool if you make underwater effects. If you raise this really high, it's going to um, be like underwater. Look like how it's how it's falling now. Um, it's gonna have like a really high density in the air, which is then similar to the density of the water. Um, or you can add some wind. This direction. These are gonna be multiplied, so we have now ten, and now it's a hundred wind speed. Um, for now, there's not really anything um, happening, so I'll be. Obviously, the wind speed is related to the air density. If we have zero air density like I have now, the wind is not going to have effect. But now we should see all this stuff flying away. Really cool. And you can play around with this and um, see what you can do. You can also add some wind noise. I'm just going to um, create some, some noise in the wind. Um, and you can see this tablecloth is about to float away. <laughs> yeah, and you can do a lot of stuff with this. Um, I'm gonna let you play around with it a bit and see what you can do. So our simulation is now finished, but we can see that it's running really slowly um, because the computer has to calculate all these frames. And right now it's doing this in real time and um, trying to catch up. And um, also, if we scrub through the simulation, we can see that it's not really updating correctly. And if you want to render this scene with Arnold or even with the Maya software renderer, um, you will have to cache the simulation beforehand because otherwise you will get um, weird results where frames don't match and you have flickering and um, because it's going to try to calculate the simulation on the fly while simulating and it's not going to be able to do that. Uh, while rendering and it's not going to be able to do that. Yeah, we need to cache this. And you can select the end cloth objects, the hair system, and the end particle. You can also cache them individually, but um, I'm just going to cache all of them at, at once. Go to end cache, create new cache, and end object. And now it's going to go through and record all, the, all these frames and write them as a file to disk. And then you're going to be able to um, view the simulation in real time and um, play it back. And you can even scrub through it. Yeah. Another option for exporting objects that are simulated uh, is the Alembic file format, which you can use to import, for example, this simulation into uh, a different program. So you can go to Cache, Alembic Cache, and export selection to Alembic or all to Alembic. And let's just export this selection to Alembic. You can go to the option box. And you have to set it to time slider, or you can set custom uh, start and end frames. You can set a step, which is how many frames it's going to step. And um, yeah, some more settings. For example, word space is useful if you want to have it exactly at this location. Um, yeah, and some other options. You can check them out yourself. And if you then export the selection, and then, for example, in Houdini, you can load this Olympic file and um, have it in this scene. If you have any uh, questions or comments, you can leave them below the video. I'm going to try to respond to every one of them. And um, yeah, this is um, basically it. As I said, you can play around with it, um, see what you can do. Um, and um, yeah, the scene will be in the description. This one, I can, I can give you this one as well, so you can check it out. And um. yeah, I hope this video was useful to you. And um, yeah, 
Uh, hope you have a great day. Bye-bye.